Welcome to ICER. I'm Diane Hirschberg, one of the faculty here, and it is my pleasure to welcome David Holland to um, give this talk on Salmon People Place, Coastal Alaska Communities that Depend on Fisheries. Um, David is a doctoral candidate, which is what he's talking about in part is, is his work toward his doctorate, but also somebody who has been a collaborator with many of us here at ICER, has um, been a visiting scholar here at ICER, <coughs> and is now a colleague of ours with a faculty position um, at UAF um, based in Anchorage. And he'll tell you a little bit more about this, but I'm just very excited that we get to hear about his work. <coughs> so thanks, Diane. Um, so Diane graciously had me come over and do a preview of my dissertation defense. I promise it will not be as long as the actual defense. Um, and I've also tried to gear it more towards um, the ICER um, audience. So there's a lot more economics in here um, in, this, in this discussion. So yeah, again, um, I'm a, a professor at, um, in the Marine Advisory Program for Alaska Sea Grant um, at UAF in the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. And over the last eight years or so, I've been also working on a doctorate um, in anthropology at UAF, um, but I am uh, originally here from here from Anchorage and um, the Anchorage area, um, and I was able to do that here uh, as part. My advisor Peter Schweitzer was really gracious to let me continue to work and and um, do this at the same time. So it's it's taken me a while because I work full time, um, but I'll talk a little bit about some of that work. So I had a. Uh, um, that was the, the title of my discussion, but I had a copy editor to go through uh, my dissertation last week, and she said I needed a more exciting title to my <laughs> dissertation. So uh, she, she and I came up with Voices from the Coast, Salmon Fishery Dependent Communities in Alaska. And that picture in the background is, uh, is a location um, at the, the Chewett River, just across um, uh, Cook Inlet here. And that's a salmon fish camp. You can see on the spit there, uh, there's some tents. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about how I came up with this, this project. Um, this is a, a culture camp in 2013. I've been working in the community of Tionic since about 2004. I did an ethnography there. Uh, before I started this position with, with UAF, I was at the Department of Fish and Game for 15 years. I left there as the subsistence program manager for Southern Alaska. And so I, I managed the subsistence program, spent a lot of time in front of the boards of fisheries and game, presenting information to them. But one of my favorite things to do was to go and actually go to culture camps. And I worked closely with this community for a long time. Um, and at one of those times, I took my father with me, who is right there. Uh, he's a retired guidance counselor from Wasilla. And uh, he was given the, the, a talk on culture and importance of culture and, and celebrating your culture. Um, he took my class, Natives of Alaska, about 10 years ago and, um, and got excited about un trying to understand more Alaska Native culture, especially as Native kids were and families were moving into the valley and he had to spend more time talking with them. He wanted to understand where they came from. Um, so at first I was a little uh, apprehensive about having him talk about culture, but he did a great job and uh, really exciting. To to, to have him and, and my son there at camp. And these are kind of special places, and I'm gonna come back to talk about special places a little bit um, here in a minute. So I came up with a research design, and I'll talk in just a sec about how that, that happened, but I have to, I wanna give you the research questions uh, that I came up with, and these are, what are community perceptions of how commercial and subsistence fishing supports and maintains cultural attitudes and values, and how do economics of a fishery shape attitudes and perceptions of community viability, and how can we measure resilience, or really, can we measure resilience of fishery-dependent communities in Alaska? And so while you're reading the, this, my objectives and methods, I'll read you something a little more interesting, which is the, an excerpt from the first couple of pages of, of my dissertation. While attending an Alaska Board of Fisheries meeting in Anchorage in 2009, I began to think about how salmon fisheries especially were intertwined in the lives of people that live in small coastal communities in Alaska. The focus of the meeting was the Bristol Bay region of Southwest Alaska, which is home to the most abundant salmon fishery in the world. 
I'd worked in Bristol Bay for seven years on various projects beginning in 2002 and conducted social science research in just about every community in Bristol Bay over that time, sometimes traveling to the same community several times a year. In Alaska, Bristol Bay has some of the most abundant Chinook and Coho salmon runs, prize fish for sport, commercial, and subsistence harvest. In most Bristol Bay subsistence fisheries, there are no harvest limits. Residents harvest what they need and are only limit, limited by their ability to process salmon. Bristol Bay also has the world's most abundant run of sockeye salmon, the Quijack River sockeye, providing millions of salmon to communities along the Quijack River and Iliamna Lake to harvest for subsistence, as well as the commercial fishery of Bristol Bay. Throughout the meeting, I listed public testimony by area residents and fishers about how they were having a hard time making a living. I collected economic data in Bristol Bay communities and knew that household incomes were low compared to urban Alaska, but there was a strong commercial fishing economy with active participation by residents of every community in Bristol Bay. Commercial fishing had been a key feature of the economy and culture of Bristol Bay region for over 100 years. Communities like Dillingham and Naknek have boat yards where hundreds of fishing boats are stored throughout the winter when not used in, in the fishery. In communities like Iliamna, far up the Quijack River, fishing boats line the edge of the lake, traveling downstream each summer to be used in the Bristol Bay fishery. What I was hearing at the meeting was in an area rich in fish, fishing history, and fishing culture, residents were having a hard time making a living. Working for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Subsistence over several projects, we had done considerable research into how residents harvest the abundant salmon runs in the subsistence and sport fisheries of Bristol Bay to feed their families. But rural Alaska is a mixed economy. People need to work as well as fish to make ends meet. I realized at the meeting I wanted to better understand the intersection of the commercial fishing economy and subsistence economy to maintain community resilience, not just in Bristol Bay, but also in other coastal communities in Alaska. So I designed a research project around three different communities. These are Chiniga Bay in Prince William Sound, um, <coughs> Kakanak in Bristol Bay, and Tionic in Upper Cook Inlet. All three are distinct Alaska Native cultures. Um, all three are in different management areas for commercial fisheries and have very different management structures. So I wanted to kind of understand the difference between them. And typically in an ethnographic project for a dissertation, you work in one community and you try to understand that community. But I wanted to understand a broader context and try to compare them. And because I worked at Fish and Game and I was managing a research program, I decided that maybe I should throw in some extra questions into a bunch of survey forms. So um, I had a, a research staff, uh, quite large at the time, about 18, including uh, graduate students, and um, I got them to uh, administer a, a couple of pages of questions as part of a larger survey. These are usually 30 or 40 page surveys, and so I threw two extra pages in there uh, about fishing economies. So I was able to expand this uh, to the Chignik area, the four communities in the Chignicks, uh, three communities in Kodiak, um, Kodiak City, uh, which is kind of a large community, and then Larson Bay and Old Harbor to kind of understand some differences between rural and urban Kodiak. And then uh, five communities in um, Southeast Alaska, all of which are very unique uh, geographically, um, culturally, um, as well as size of the community. So they're all very unique. So we, we picked out, we didn't have a lot of money so I picked out five communities that were, were somewhat unique. And I also tried to do uh, Sitka, but the, the data for that isn't done yet. So looking at methods, um, I want to just briefly talk about ethnographic methods that were used in this. And this is some work I did out in the Quijack watershed, working in the community of Nondalton. And it's one of my favorite pictures on the right. It's my first day of research. I forgot my extra tufts. You can see I'm standing in the water with bare feet. <laughs> Um, and I'm talking to the late Oxina Del Kitty who had fished at this site for over 50 years. And it was amazing to hear how that one location had changed in 50 years um, from a very tundra environment to woodlands, the forest starting to overtake it, and the changes in the water. Um, and of course, um, as, as you know, anthropologists working in a native community, we're free labor. Um, so there we are helping somebody cut up all their fish. Uh, we didn't do a very good job, by the way. but. Um, we got the job done, so. So we do a lot of participant observation. Um, that's my vanity shot. I'm from Wasilla, so I like anything with a throttle on it. <laughs> um, so. 
so. Filmability. Yeah. It's, um, but, you know, that, that picture down on the bottom left is also one of my favorite ones. That, that, that boy is actually now 20 and, and one of the main hunters of Tyonic. Um, but here it is, a, a family fishery. You've got mom and her son helping to gut the fish. And then it goes around the table and Jane starts to cut the head off. And, and then Harriet uh, in the bottom left is actually the one that, that cuts the final filet. And she's the one that makes sure it's done right. And uh, she'll come up a little bit in, more in this discussion. And this was back in 2004. Like I said, things have really changed in that community. Uh, that boy's grown up, but the, the, the process and the way that the, that's, this works is still the same. And like any good uh, you know, researcher, I had to do survey questions, try to co collect some quantitative data, which I'll pr present to you. And these are my sampling methods. We, we, uh, or the sampling sheet, uh, we, we came up with a, a pretty good sample uh, in most communities, except for Tyonic, we only got about 60% sample. Uh, but the other communities, I got about almost 90% of, of the community. 80% and above is usually pretty statistically good for a, a household harvest survey. Excuse me, did you also get those, are you talking about all the communities that, that, that you showed from that pick other map? Yes. These three? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So these are the three core communities, but yes, we did do, uh, we do have sampling for the rest of them. So um, in terms of key respondents, just an op observation, I did 24 in-depth respondents in the th three core study communities. I asked additional questions while administering the surveys to get more data. Um, I participated in ac activities, and I had been for, you know, 15 years in all three of those communities. And I did additional interviews and participant observation in Southeast Alaska uh, uh, over several years working on quite a few different projects. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, why salmon fishing. And I, salmon fishing is very important to the local economy. And it's also about place. Um, at the bottom left is Hoktaheen Cove outside of Huna. It's about a two hour drive by boat. And I worked there to try to understand their, their subsistence fishery and how they do it as a communal activity. Um, while I was working on a project to, to prepare for the Board of Fisheries, um, some proposals that we had to present to them. And it's also, you know, for, for my own self, it's also about place. That's my cabin in Montana Creek, or right above Montana Creek. And, you know, you can see the salmon on the side there. Um, my mother got that for me. Um, so it's, you know, fishing really is about place. This is a place that I go and fish with my son in Montana Creek. We go to the same place every year. Um, we catch. Um, you know, coho that are a little probably uh, beyond what we should be catching because they're, they're kind of beat up by then. Uh, but they're, they're good for tacos and stuff. But it's, it's really about fun. You know, it's, it's about taking him down there and fishing every year at the same location. And it's the same thing for Hoktaheen Cove. I mean, who wouldn't want to fish there? I mean, it's beautiful there. That's got to be one of the most beautiful places in Alaska. So just looking at some of the statistics, uh, working for the division, I had access to a lot of data. And, I, and Jim Fall, the research director, put together some of this information and I, I kind of took it and reformulated it and adapted it for this, for this dissertation work. And you can see that um, salmon is in blue on the left and in all parts of Alaska, it makes up some of the economy. Um, a little bit more in places like South Central Alaska, Southwest Alaska, it's, it's a big part of the diet. And this is in pounds usable weight, uh, so those percentages. I looked at the data that I had for, for the three communities I worked in. Um, you know, at the time, uh, Tyonic, the most recent one, I had done a survey there in 2006. I actually went back in 2013 and did another survey, but this was prior to this. And I'd also worked in Kakanak and Shiniga Bay. And you can see that salmon makes up a large component of the harvest in all three of those places, even in Shiniga Bay with access to abundant uh, non-salmon fish resources. So I asked, I asked in communities, and this is from Kakanak, why, do you, why is fishing so important to you? And the three reasons that came up in Kakanak um, were reliance on fish for subsistence, cultural continuity, and economics. So this is um, a, a fish camp in um, Harriet Kaufman's fish camp down in Tyonic, and, and she, she talked about this, and I wanted to just read briefly a little bit about that fish camp um, for you. 
Near the community of Tionic at Roberts Creek Fish Camp, there are three cabins occupied by siblings who have been participating in fishing at this site since they were children. For over 10 years, I've been traveling down to fish camp to talk with a family and observe their fishery. No fishing occurs until the matriarch of the camp, Harriet Kaufman, arrives. Harriet tries to come down to the camp from the village in the morning for the early tide and then again have to work for the late tide. The salmon migrate close to the west shore of Cook Inlet, each spring arriving on the high tide. The fishery opens May 15th each year and residents have three weekly opportunities to fish both tides, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Fridays, through mid-June to harvest Chinook salmon, their preferred traditional species. There were several important reasons why residents prefer Chinook salmon over other species and why proper processing is important. Chinook arrive early in the season, are large, and are oily. Processing Chinook with their thick oily meat is different from other species. The meat must be cut in an exact thickness or it will spoil. It is typical in Tionic, as in other Denina Athabascan communities, for fish camps to be led by a senior woman within an extended family. Without her guidance, salmon may not be processed correctly and may spoil, leaving the family without adequate food for the rest of the year. Chinook are by far the largest salmon available. They supply a great deal of food and are harvested and processed efficiently. In terms of time spent fishing and processing, Chinook provide more food per time or energy unit spent than other salmon. Chinook are still processed for traditional product such as bolik and backbones that at Toyonic are not processed for other species. Chinook salmon are rich in fat and oil. Nutritionally, in terms of taste, local observers report they're superior to other salmon. Traditional knowledge and skills concerning fishing and processing are predicated on Chinook salmon. Techniques, especially for processing Chinook, are not the same for other species. Harriet told me she's lived in Tionic her entire life and has fished every season. Salmon are important for her household for three reasons, dietary or subsistence, culture, and economic. These three categories were also expressed in Tionic during the surveys and interviews. Residents expressed that salmon were important for subsistence, cultural continuity, and economic reasons. And you can, as you can see here for Cocknock. So here's um, just looking at some of the basic statistics. So I divided this up into those three categories, uh, subsistence, culture, and economics. And that's how I structured this discussion and the dissertation as a whole. You can see here that in terms of residents, these are individual residents. So everybody in the community from the youngest child to, the, to an elder, um, the percent of residents actually fishing at Chinga Bay is around 36%. In Kakanak, it's about 64%. And in Tionic, it's um, 68%. And there's a little bit more involvement in actual processing. And Chinga Bay is one I wanted to bring up. Uh, there's a difference in, in how they fish. Um, and in Chinega Bay, they actually put out drift nets. And so there's very few boats in the community and, very, and there's only two nets. And so people go in together, they pay for the gas, some people provide the boat, some people provide the time. And so they share these two nets. And that's why there's, a, there's lower participation. But as you'll see later, there's still a higher harvest because that fish then comes in is widely distributed throughout the community. Whereas in Kakadak and Tionic, they can fish on the beach. Um, and they have set nets, so everybody can go down and help out with the set net uh, fishing. In, in many communities in Alaska, um, there's something that the Division of Subsistence came up with called the 30-70 rule. And, and that means that 30% of households take about 70% of the harvest. Um, so they're specialists in these communities. And so if you think about uh, Chinega Bay, for example, that's a perfect example of this. You've got a very small component of the community harvesting larger and then, and then sharing it widely, sharing being an important component of subsistence. So in Chinega Bay, about 25% of households took 67% of the harvest. But these are fairly consistent across the other communities too. Uh, Kakanak was the same. 26% uh, of households took 69% of the harvest. And in Tionic, it was even higher. 18% of households took 69% of the harvest. Some people have more time to go down there during the week and put out their nets. And in Tionic, with the Chinook salmon fishery in Upper Cook Inlet, the way it is, uh, those, those Chinook come in, and then they might be gone, and you don't see them again for a little while. It, there's just not at the abundance that there once was. And I'll talk about that later when it comes to uh, commercial fishing. So 
you know, fishing, especially for subsistence, is a commercial activity. And there's Harriet in the background with her brother, Art. And um, he's pointing out to a couple of my, my, my students here. Um, I sent them down to do genetic sampling and then collect traditional knowledge data. So they're comparing the two. Um, you know, where do you think your salmon is headed towards? And then actually collecting a genetic sample, which will actually tell us where that, that what watershed that, that fish is headed to. And Art here is, is pointing out um, the shape of the tail. And as it gets flatter, it gets closer to its natal stream, is, is what he's saying. So he says this was actually a Kenai fish, and it was just on the wrong side of the inlet at the time. <laughs> it's important for culture, and, and again, back to that fish camp, um, you know, at, the, at these camps, you know, we, we wanted to go down and actually do one where we went fishing, and, and that's something that came later. We get the kids out, and we talk about fishing and why it's important. Um, there's also the drumming that goes on, and then games on the right. That's my son getting beat at the uh, stick pole. And by the way, that girl beat me two times in a row. She was the champion stick pole, uh, puller for the state. The, and fishing helps kids form their identity and work together as a group. Everyone has to get along at fish camp. You have to help everyone. It's important for the entire community. And this is a Kakanak uh, fisher and mother who, who makes her kids come down to fish camp every year and work together as, in a collaborative effort. And Kakanak is by far the champion subsistence salmon harvester community in the state. Uh, their average harvest is, is right around 288 fish per household, which is pretty high across the state. Um, and so it's very important for them. And it goes also back to that, that sense of place. This is my son fishing at um, the Kasilaf River on the, um, on the south shore. We go there every year to fish and we would not go anywhere else to dip net. That, that is our place that we've established 10 years running. So, you know, these people also talked about the sense of place, which will come up in a, a little bit in the statistics. Regarding youth and the next generation, um, I love this picture because it, it embodies subsistence in the modern economy um, with the oil rig in the background. Um, it's just something that's in their blood. It was something that was handed down to them by their parents. That's why we are called beach people. And this is Harriet. Uh, Tabona is the name of the, the, um, the people of, of Tyonic. Tabona means beach people. And that's what they, they call themselves. And so fishing is very important to them since they arrived on those shores uh, a few hundred years ago. So I asked uh, in terms of economics, how important fishing is to your community. And you can see um, Chiniga Bay had a little higher percentage of people saying it's not as important. That is the harbor um, in Chiniga Bay that was built in the, in the 80s. Uh, Chiniga Bay was a community that was reestablished after the earthquake. Um, so uh, their community was at a different site. And um, go ahead, Gunnar. My question is, the question you asked, how was it phrased and was it was it, did it relate, how, was the question how important is subsistence fishing or how, how important is fishing? How important is fishing to your ec economy, to your community? Yes. So the, the idea being that not just thinking about it in terms of subsistence or commercial, but in terms of your community as a whole. So people there said that in term, in this, in this case, um, they didn't think it was very important in terms of economics. Um, and economics being whether it has to do with, um, you know, subsistence or commercial. And they'll come up here in a minute. But you can see this is the, uh, the dock there in Chenega Bay, and there's no commercial fishing boats in that dock. Um, and there hasn't been in a very long time. So they tried to reestablish the community as a commercial fishing place for Alutic people that um, were displaced by the earthquake. And um, most of them have moved over to uh, Valdez or Cordoba or they live in Anchorage, and then they come down and they just fish during the season. Uh, but very few people have come back there. It's becoming mostly a retirement community. There's some very nice uh, weekend and summer homes being built there uh, by, by people that mainly live in Anchorage. Um, Alutic people mainly live in Anchorage. So you can see on the right that, that for the most part, people say it's important, uh, but you know there's differences depending on place. And, and notice that in Kakanak, nobody said it's not important. 
And this is one of the comments that came up, is when you catch a lot of salmon, then you don't have to buy as much food, and you can spend money on other things. So thinking in terms of economy, even in the subsistence of fishery, this is the, the comment that, that I got. And, and kids are so great for giving you honest answers uh, when you ask them. And so you can look at these two, just, you know, this is a busy chart. Um, but if you just look at these two um, factors, per capita harvest in these communities in terms of pounds is fairly high, Kanak Kanak being the highest. Uh, Tionic had a, a pretty low year in terms of, of Chinook harvest, so it was, was fairly low. It still made up about 70% of their harvest overall, but still fairly low. Um, and then the actual mean household harvest, and so that's the, the household itself, the, the number of salmon is in Kakanak was 288, the Tioke was 45, and then Chinega Bay was 85. So if you averaged out the entire harvest by, of the community by household, that's what it came out to be. And if you think about this in terms of, of an urban community, for example, I showed you the picture of my son on the beach. The highest number we've ever caught is 45. That's our limit for our household. And, and many households in urban Alaska do not catch anything near that over the course of a year. So thinking about also economics and commercial fisheries, I asked, you know, is there a member of your household of commercial fishes? And Kakanak had the highest uh, percentage of households that had at least one member commercial fishing in the last year. Uh, Tionic was very low. In Chiniga Bay, mainly they get picked up by relatives and friends. They'll come by Chiniga and they'll, they'll sign on as crew for the, for the season or they'll go out and help. So uh, nobody actually commercial fishes there and I don't have any data on that, which I'll show you, but, um, but people do participate in some way, rarely though. And it, the comment, going back to the comment about as a young person, it gets in your blood and you're hooked. That's one thing that people kept telling me that, you know, once young people start fishing, they, they just can't stop. They'll, they'll com continue to commercial fish. And so you can see, though, that some of these communities um, have a very low young population, Chiniga Bay being one of them. They're always in danger of having their school closed. Uh, but Tionic and Kakanak have fairly um, consistent uh, young populations with uh, Tionic having a little bit more in those age categories. Uh, they have a pretty active school there, and people want to keep their kids in school. Uh, they also have a lot of, of single moms that live there. And, and they, you know, they, they go to Anchorage and they come back with their kids and um, they then are helped. There's a lot, the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, everybody helps raise those kids. And it's a really great place to raise kids. And that's what people keep telling me. Um, and that's one of the reasons they always come back. Um, and then their kids go to school there. So, I wanted to kind of understand, people kept telling me that they got out of the fishery and why that happened. And so I looked at the CFEC data, the Commercial Fisheries Entry Commission data, to, to look at these three key compute, uh, communities, Tionic, Kakanak, and Chiniga Bay. There was no data for Chiniga Bay because there hadn't been any permits there for quite a while. Uh, but there was for Tionic and for Kakanak. The, the bars there are the number of permit holders per community and the, uh, the line there is the estimated gross earnings per community. And you can see it, it somewhat follows a, a general trend um, with it kind of bottoming out right around the early 2000s. And this is when people told me that they, they started to get out of the fishery, that they, they were losing so much money. The price of gas was going up, uh, the price of getting ice uh, there's more. There's a higher demand for number one fish, or you know, fish that it has been chilled. Um, you know, uh, they they've been uh, gilled and, and bled and chilled right away. Um, so you have a higher value of the fish, and so those costs have gone up. Um, and there's also some other issues. You can see here that. Can we just go back to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. up to 2003, that's, that's the drop in participation is not as great as mm -hmm. occurred five years earlier. Mm -hmm. And so, 
So what I'm saying is, I, I'm just not, I don't see that story that you just told in, in, the, um, in the graphs. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. So one thing that people said is they tried to hold on. And so even though things were dropping and they were losing money, they tried to hold on for several years. And it wasn't until, you know, things that after they went several years that that's when they decided to get out, that they kept losing money year after year after year. So that's a, that's a very good point. And these are the price per pound that, that were paid um, in the Coconut case uh, for the Bristol Bay fishery. And you can definitely see a low payment in, in those in the years starting around 2000 or so. And then it did go back up. And um, when I was doing surveys in South Naknek, I remember about 2010 or 2008, I did actually interview quite a few households that said that, you know, they gave me their wages for the year and what they were earning was a living wage in the commercial fishery again. And they said that that was something that was, was really important to them. They wanted to continue to fish, but they had to earn that living wage. So it did, it did actually go up after a while. You can see in the late uh, 2000s. But the, the case in Tionic is a little bit harder to understand. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, and one of the things that people kept talking about was the Chinook salmon fishery. And this is the Northern District commercial harvest. Chinook are on the left in blue. And by 2013, they're almost not in the data. And that had to do with um, closing most of the commercial fishery in the, in the Northern District for Chinook salmon. And so now the fishery doesn't open until the Chinook runs have come through. And that has to do with the abundance of Chinook, not just in the Northern District, but statewide, uh, not harvesting those resources. And the problem for, for, for communities like Tionic is that they used to be well known for, for these harvests. And they would send tenders over, they would send ice over to the community. Um, people would come, you know, they would pick the fish up in the tender. Um, sometimes they'd even fly them out. It actually made economic sense at 50 cents a pound to fly out fish and ice in a cooler um, to Anchorage. And then they would be on restaurant um, plates within a couple of days. Um, and so that made sense. But with the closure, of, of the ability to actually harvest those Chinook has really affected that community economically. Uh, tenders don't come there anymore. Uh, they're having a hard time selling their fish even in Anchorage when they fly it out. And there's only a few people left that consistently fish as part of their, their entire income for the year. It, but it's, it is getting more difficult. And so really it's that, that Chinook that's, that's really driven this um, even though you can see that they're still catching sockeye and coho. Um, coho, of course, being the second highest paid for, uh, price. Now, I want to also just give you a little bit of the data that I, that I gathered for um, some of the comparative communities. And this is one of my, my favorite cases of, of fisheries change, in, especially in southeast Alaska. On the right, I never got a good picture of this. But that, that graveyard, there must have been 30 or 40 commercial boats in that graveyard. Mm. And um, as looking out, uh, that dock is on the left there at the entrance to that, air, to that little lagoon there. And they, they just take them in there, they put them on the beach and they strip every usable part and take the oil out and, and they just leave them there and they rot. Um, even in that, that dock there on the left, I walked by one commercial boat and it had a tree growing out of it. I mean, not like, you know, some plants. There was an actual tree growing out of the, tr the boat um, and had been for quite some time. It was quite, getting to be quite the old tree. Um, but what you do see here in that picture is a lot of sport fishing boats. And so they have converted, they, they had some hard times in the commercial fishery, but they picked up sport fishing. And Whaler's Cove is actually um, on Killisnoo Island right there in Angoon. It's a huge facility for sport fishing in the area and provides a lot of jobs for the community. So people have been able to work as guides. They also work in all the services that are required from a very large sport fishing lodge. It's like a small city. Um, and then quite a few people in, in the community itself actually have sport fishing 
um, license, um, guide licenses and, and also run their own operations. So it's not just the big ones, there's some small ones too. Um, people actually earning a pretty good living guiding sport fishing in the area. Commercial fishing still is important and Heidelberg's a great case. Uh, this is the community of Heidelberg and right underneath the graph there is, is a large shrimp, shrimp boat, uh, one of the largest in the, in the community. Did fairly well that year and there are some other growing this is a kind of a growing economy in Heidelberg as they kind of move into shellfish. Um, and they are actually looking at opening their own plant uh, right there in Heidelberg that's funded by the, by the tribal government. Um, and so they're building a plant right now um, to do their own processing. And uh, in, in a lot of these communities, one thing I found is it's really driven by a few key individuals. Um, and Tony Christensen, who's the mayor, also works in, in the um, tribal office there as their environmental coordinator has been really instrumental in kind of some of these really progressive ideas and rebuilding the economy of the community and protecting their their way of life and so in, in terms of all earned income in Heidelberg 47 percent was agricultural forestry and fishing and I unfortunately I'm not able to break that down um, but most of that is fishing there's very little um, of the, the well there's not much agriculture going on um, but, uh, but there is a little bit of forestry, uh, but most of that is, is actually commercial fishing. And if you look at Huna, um, Huna is a, a much more diverse economy. It's a much larger community. 19% um, of, of the income is really from fishing um, in that community. And they have, like I said, it's a much larger economy um, with a lot more diversity. And so, and in services and retail is becoming more important as more cruise ships come in and um, also guiding services. So one of the things I, I got done with my survey and I was like, I really want to know some other things like what's your percentage of income and I didn't include that in the survey. So I had this done in the Chignik area. And the one that I, I want you to look at there is especially um, is, is the community of Chignik Lagoon, and you can see about almost 40% of um, household income in that community comes from people of households actually make all of their income off of commercial fishing. Um, and that's, you know, it's still fairly high even in the other communities. So one of the, the interesting things for me was that even though you have four communities that are right next to each other, that are very similar in terms of their history and their families, they're very different. They're still all very different. And, and their subsistence harvest shows that as well. Um, they're very different. But you can see here that in this, this location, of course the Chignik area is, is well known for their, for their fishery, their salmon fishery, so there's, there's good income here. Um, and in Southeast, uh, Angoon had some people that were participating uh, you saw a few boats in that picture, a few commercial boats. Um, Haynes, of course, has a, a very robust commercial fishery, and Huna does as well. The other two communities, uh, Whale Pass and Heidelberg. Uh, Heidelberg, at the time, I didn't have data for. They had just kind of emerged into that shellfish fishery, um, and, and some people were moving into the community. But And Whale Pass is mostly a sport fishing location. Uh, so they're mostly engaged in the sport fishery. It's also a very small community on, on Prince of Wales. Now, thinking about the sense of place, this is a kind of an interesting statistic we did in the southeast. We asked people, how have you used the same location annually, and what's the average number of years? And you can see at a place like Angoon, that the average number of years that a household had used that location was 40, almost 47 per years that they had been using that location. Um, so people continue to go back to these same locations over time. Heidelberg was the same way. Huna was a little lower. Um, Hoktaheen Cove is their preferred location, but it's two hours away. It's difficult to get to. So sometimes people have to trade off. Um, also, when you go there, if you do not hit the tide right, if there's a lot of rain, the rain will come down and those fish will go straight up the river as soon as they get there. They won't sit around in front of the river. If it's a dry and the river and the tide is low and the water in the river is low, then 
they can get there and the fish will school around right in front. They're not allowed to actually set, have their net touch anything. It has to just float freely out there. So it's a very difficult place to fish because of the regula regulations. Um, but if, if they get there right, it can be very lucrative in terms of, of subsistence. So sometimes they have to trade off and use other locations. So, just to summarize here, now I'll give you, while you're, while you're looking at this graph, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my conclusion. So thinking about salmon people in place. So back to the key question I had back in 2009 at the Alaska Board of Fisheries meeting in Anchorage. Listening to the board meeting that people were having a hard time making a living, what I really missed was that this area of the state is rich in fish, fishing history and fishing culture. That was the point of the testimony. I had to turn the question around to understand that it is the fisheries that make these communities resilient. Residents having a hard time making a living was only part of the conversation. It's now evident that residents of rural Alaska communities value their fishery for their lifestyle it provides, and we're simply seeking opportunities to safeguard a way of life that allows for living meaningful lives in their communities while ensuring the future of the fishery for their children. Small communities in Alaska are places where people choose to live for a subsistence lifestyle. Although questions were asked of residents that attempt to quantify common responses to why they continue to live their lives in these small coastal fishing communities, it was through the in-depth ethnographic interviews that residents were able to fully articulate how their lives were intertwined with those of salmon. In Chenega Bay, Dennis Sakar and Tom Sherman both commented on how the lifestyle is part of why they both chose to remain in Chenega Bay. Chenega Bay is within the heart of Prince William Sound, easy access by boat to fishing and hunting opportunities, an environment plentiful in wild resources, especially fish. Everyone is involved in the subsistence fishery in one way or another, and the commercial, fish, commercial fishery is vital for the livelihood of the region, they said, which was also articulated by other residents in Chenega Bay. They both plan on staying in the community because of the lifestyle. Chenega Bay is quiet, it's peaceful, and it's safe. Salmon and fishing is a way of life for people, for people is vital for community vitality and well-being. Rory Andrews says that Kakanak is steadily growing and, was, and is always going to be here. He thinks that both the commercial and subsistence fisheries will continue to be a large part of life for people. To him, Kakanak is a fishing community, and salmon are an important part of their way of life. Art Stanifer of Tionic makes a statement that embodies many of the comments that were heard through the course of this research. Tionic will exist forever and fishing will always be a part of the community. I was born here and raised here, this is my home. Fishing each summer has been and continues to be a big part of life for him and his family. Fishing together as a family and as a community reaffirms the responsibilities that each community member has to one another. His extended family has to work together at fish camp and his community has to work together to maintain fishing opportunities. There are challenges. Youth involvement and interest in fishing both for economy and subsistence is consistent and appears to be growing well with residents of at least two of the three study communities, Taiwan and Kakanak, articulating a desire to ensure this economy and a way of life continue. And so at the end of the, the surveys, I asked people why, this is my basic question, why, why, do, you still, why do you live here? Um, I mean, it's, it's a very simple question. And, and these are some of the, the things I, I found, and these are the three core study communities. Most people just said it's home, like, like the, the discussion I just read. They enjoy the subsistence way of life. Interestingly, some people said freedom. Um, and I have a, a colleague, um, Alan Boras, who did very, very similar work in Bristol Bay, and he, he found the same thing, that that was a comment that people said, freedom. You know, they, they enjoy, that means that they, they have the ability to live the life that they want to lead um, in, in their own way. So I asked these questions in other communities as well. Um, they were asked in the Chignik communities, family was a big part of it, uh, jobs in some areas, and you can see that there was a high percentage of, of wage earners that got their living from the commercial fishery in those communities. So that was important for them. Um, and of course, the, just living the subsistence lifestyle, um, Perryville was one of those communities where maybe not as high in terms of economics from subsistence, from commercial fishing, but the, the subsistence lifestyle was something that was very important to them. 
And also in Kodiak, we did uh, two, uh, in Kodiak City, there were actually two different survey strata. Uh, there was people that actually held subsistence permits and then did a strata of the general population as well. And so you found a little bit different um, responses from them in terms of, uh, you can see in terms of family, for example, those that held permits, um, it was a little bit lower, but in terms of the general population, most people, a lot of people said that family was a big reason for continuing to live there. It's home, they have jobs there, there's good, the economy is good there in terms of commercial fishing, um, sense of community, and, and just living in the natural environments as well. So, I guess finally, that's this is my final part is that, you know, this is what I kind of learned that fishing is a part of a sense of identity and it's who we are. So, so thank you. So what I did ask is, if you plan to leave, why would you plan to leave? And so, you know, I, I have talked to people that, that moved into Anchorage, and oftentimes it, it's mostly for economics. You know, they, there, there's a large contingent of people, like from Tionic, for example, that live in the valley. Um, they moved into the valley. Because it's, you know, out in the valley, you can get a nice piece of property, and it's, you still kind of live that lifestyle, but you have closer access to jobs. Um, so that was the case, and, and a lot of people said it had to do with um, just getting older, that they would leave, um, that they wanted, to, they wanted better jobs, and in some cases they wanted more education opportunities for their kids. So once their kids did get older, they, wanted to, they started to think about that, whether they need to actually move into town or, or just you know, find a boarding school for their, for their children. That's a good question. I guess uh, I, I would you know, hypothesize that, that if, you ask, if you try to think about this question of why do people live where they are, mm -hmm. um, like, your, like your results said, it's, it's the com combined effect of a whole lot of things mm -hmm. all going on at once. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, ranging hard to leave a place mm -hmm. if you're tied to it, um, both by things you like or, or also by the costs that are involved in moving, so that, that'd be one. And then also the positive features, the, the opportunities associated with that. But um, you don't necessarily, there are probably certain things about uh, uh, wherever we live, including Alaska Native people, that have always been that way and you kind of take them for granted. And if those were, and you may not say that's part of why I live here. Mm -hmm. if, it, if that if those change, those might be reasons. Okay. Uh, reasons for leaving, um, and and and, um, yeah, and so for example, if the school closes, mm -hmm. people people don't say, "Oh, I live here because there's a school," but if the school went away, you know, then, yeah. you, then you might you might leave. Exactly. Um, and and I just sort of worry that. Um, stuff going on in the cash economy in general that is changing, you know, both sort of costs, say, say costs of fuel changing um, and getting higher or lower, that can be a factor in whether people may mm -hmm. never have thought about, but when it gets really expensive to heat your house, so they may say, well, actually, I, I can't do it, it's too expensive. 
or as well as other government services that are provided that that aren't necessarily guaranteed under our new fiscal uh, regime, such as you know they keep operating the airport, or that or that you know the transportation services continue to be provided to the community, or, or ferry service continues to run, uh, and so on. But I think that one thing that your surveys do make clear is that fishing and access to fishing is, is really important, or can be really important in two different ways, two major ways. Mm -hmm. One is all the things associated with subsistence fishing, which range from food to all of these things that are part of the culture and the experience and, and the, its home. Mm -hmm. And then also this commercial fishing thing that in some places is sort of a major share of that economy. So I think I, I, I just think if your question of why do people live where they are, it's a, it's a really deep and complex yes. question that um, we can't necessarily explain and articulate to ourselves fully. We mm -hmm. can certainly say things that are part of it, but we can't probably more than we. Okay. No, thank you for that. I mean, and, and, and I it'd be good to qualify that. You just if you just think, I mean, the people that have been to any, any of these places, you realize each one, like you said, is really unique and mm -hmm. really different. And, and also people are different. And it's just different. Like, I, I happened to spend some time in those chicken communities some years ago. <laughs> Pretty different kinds of people, mm -hmm. even though some of them are related <laughs> in, in those three different chicken Yeah. I think it not only is, is it one of those ways in which they help maintain a resilient economy, yeah. but it, in many ways, and I don't think I articulated this well enough for this talk, there's also this cultural component of commercial fishing, that, that kids grow up in a commercial fishery. And one of the, the issues with people kind of getting out of the fishery in the, you know, back in the early 2000s and then reemerging into the fishery is this, uh, is this generation of kids that didn't grow up doing that. They didn't grow up on their dad or mom's boat. And so, or, or helping out, you know, at, at the beach, you know, pulling the nets in or picking the fish, so. Um, but in some ways, subsistence helped bridge that gap, you know, because they continued to fish. They just weren't fishing for economy you know, for economic reasons, for uh, to sell it. I mean, fishing has taken on this whole new dynamic with, with, you know, taking a commodity that's important for you culturally and for food security and selling it. Yeah. And I, I do go into that, that whole dichotomy there of, of thinking about that because it's a fascinating thing that you would take something so personal to you and then sell it. Um, so, you know, but, but thinking about that, I think that's that's one of the things to think about is that there is this generation of kids that might have, they're just now getting back into the fishery. And some of them are like in their 20s and they didn't really grow up fishing. But they find it as a way to stay in their community. And there, there's a whole generation I found and a lot, you know, for 15 years of doing this, it's these guys in their 30s and, and women that come back and bring their kids back. And they're the ones that are like these really engaged community people like the movers and shakers of the community because they come back and they're like I grew up here and then I left and I came back and I'm like now I want this again. They understand maybe their importance of it or what they yeah. care about. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, thank you. There's three of my students in the, in the room. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a couple of different questions. I was wondering about if you notice any differences in of cash employment that people had? Like, it seems to me that there are some jobs that are more amenable to subsistence fishing or commercial fishing mm -hmm. on the side in the summers. And if that, you know, I was just thinking about some of those graphs where you were showing the large number of people that it's only one to 25% who 
commercial fishing is only one to 25% yeah. of their household income. So you know, is there some difference in how their other job, their other cash employment impacts their ability to fish? Um, I was also interested similarly about the type of commercial fishing that they engage mm -hmm. in. Like if you're a hand troller or a power troller or a saner, if you're working on a large crab fishing boat, those are all very different types of yes. engaging in, in commercial fishing. And some of those are easier to kind of pass down through the generations. Like being a deckhand on a boat, you don't necessarily have to have the infrastructure mm -hmm. to commence all those different types of training. And I, I know at Southeast, like our, um, well, I'm from Puna actually. I, I've yeah. done pop game before. Cool. Um, so it's cool to see pictures of that up there. But, um, <coughs> you know, a lot of the seining industry has really declined, but there's still a large number of hand trollers that are going. It's just a really small, a much smaller scale economy and economic engagement. Mm -hmm. But it's still there and still a core because yeah. we have people out there who are literally hand trolling with a line and pulling it in by hand and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and and uh, as one last comment, I was really curious to see that there are a number of people who said that subsistence foods were why they stayed more so than the subsistence lifestyle. Yeah. I, just, I thought that was curious and, and wondered if that had to do with the sharing. Like they weren't necessarily there to go out and, and harvest the fish, mm -hmm. but because they were living in that community, they had access to people sharing. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, the econ in terms of economy, um, there's a lot of jobs that allow for that subsistence time off. And, and that's one reason that people choose those jobs. And unfortunately, you know, looking at this, the number of average jobs that a person has in the community is like two or three. And they're all always part time. There's not a lot of ver there's very few full time positions. And so somebody might have two or three different jobs throughout the year. I've seen much higher than that. Um, you know, anything from being the bingo caller to, you know, working in the council office to, you know, there's a, there's a lot of those local jobs or working as a grader in the summer. Um, and the other part of that is, is that when they do commercial fish, somebody else in the household has to pick up the slack and do the subsistence fishing because it often occurs at the same time. And I do go into that quite a bit in, the, in my dissertation because it's, it's something I found and, you know, over time is that there's always these people in the household that, We'll do the subsistence fishing while somebody else is off commercial fishing. And, you know, and especially like Bristol Bay, they don't bring their fish home. They sell it all. And then they catch their fish from their own location. It's important to catch their fish from, like, near their community, not to bring it home from somewhere else. I, li I liked your comment about the, the, the different types of uh, fishing jobs because Huna's a very good example. I, I talked to a lot of young guys there that can ac access and enter the fishery through those hand trollers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how they get in. Mm -hmm. And there's this, this whole discussion going on about this grain of the fleet. And, you know, there's also some other studies that have been done about like, um, you know, in Southeast, about how people are start, all these young people are entering the fishery, starting out with these small scale fishing jobs. And Southeast is a perfect example because that's an opportunity that's not available in other parts of the state. So you don't, you don't have hand trolling like that in other places. Because it's a winter fishery a lot of times. And most other parts of the state are frozen over, so there is no winter fishery. Unless you're like digging through the ice for, for crab in Norton Sound. So, but I mean, I, you know, and, and, in, and I think uh, your comment about the, is, it is very interesting, that, that dynamic between just food and activity. You know, and, and having access to both of those. I just think they're they're both important, and, and that's an interesting way to think about it. So, yeah. Um, so mine is not an economics question, but <laughs> um, and that's not my reason for being here. But I want to say, a, I really appreciate that the sense of place in general is something that, as Enner was mentioning, is to most of us, even about our own sense of place, very mm -hmm. meaningful, and something we don't necessarily discuss. And so having a light illuminate mm -hmm. what that means and what some of the components are. I doubt that there's ever any study that or discipline that could get to all of that embodied no. sense of place. And so get it, setting that as a goal would probably never happen. But this is immensely intriguing. And, and so thank you very much for being yeah. willing to undertake um, in the conference for the last three days uh, the human dynamic in some cases, in some conversations, which refer to as the fluffy bunnies, <laughs> of um, engaging with the science and the economics that yeah. was also very prevalent. So thank you for pursuing some of the fluffy bunnies. 
Um, <laughs> and I was also curious because another dynamic that I observed in the conference from the last three days was the um, sort of the regulatory aspect versus mm -hmm. the, the cultural component, maybe versus isn't the right word, but then also the academic perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, there aren't many people who are your, you know, kind of uh, who have the privilege of being in your position where you were coming from, you know, ADFMG, and that, but you had a heart for understanding the cultural component of it, and now you've moved into a much more academic mm -hmm. perspective on it. And I was wondering if, if you had any observations or reflections on how your perspective may have changed over this you know, pretty long engagement with the I think part of it actually comes from all of the hours and hours I've spent in front of the board trying to explain why subsistence is important to communities and um, and what and how the regulatory structure could try to reflect that because it's, it's just not there I mean that you know that regulatory books like that thick um, and there's a reason for that you know because every part of the state is different um, so I think that's that's something I had learned over time in trying to craft proposals and projects that help meet those needs that try to help not just the regulatory, you know, the board understand, but also like the rest of the department understand that human components, that human dimension to it. And I think that's something I learned over time is how to articulate that to, you know, people that are biologists. and. And there's a whole, I think, in my, in my mind, there's a whole generation of, of natural scientists that like work for the Department of Fish and Game and others that are actually interested in that. They're, they're actually interested in more than just abundance and MSY and all of that. You know, they, they actually want to know what this really means to people. Um, and I think, you know, part of it is the, the maturing of, of, the, of, of that, but also the fact that there's a lot more people that depend on these resources now. And, um, and, and participate. And I think that's the biggest thing I've learned over time is that, you know, subsistence economies are to provide food, and the, but there's also the, all this, this human component of participation in it. And the idea behind that is to provide maximum opportunity, not maximum success, but actually maximum opportunity and actually going out there and harvesting. Um, and having that ability to, to participate in that is very important. And I think there's a real real realization uh, by managers now that that's also a real important component to, of, the, of the management scheme. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I like the fluffy bunnies. <laughs> well, I think on fluffy bunnies. Thank yes, you thank you, Diane. Again for yeah. Uh, the talk and if you want to stay in chat you can call us. Yes. Um, can I just say one thing to all the people who